to our Albert Maisel's tribute. A seminal documentarian on whose shoulders all we stand. I'm Jackie LaFaro, director of the film festival. In honor of Albert and 93-year-old Iris Apfel, who is a fashion maven for years and years, myself and my team dressed up and wore all of this bling in honor of her to be like her. But, let me, but before we watch the Maisel film, I want to take a few minutes to paint the scene when reality filmmaking was born. In the early 1960s, Robert Drew, a Life magazine correspondent and editor, formed Drew Associates a new to make a new kind of documentary. And his core crew were Ricky Leacock, D.A. Penny Baker, and Albert Mazels. Their equipment was brand new, complicated, but sync sound cameras that combined sound and film in one small package that had never, ever existed before. What they had were horrendously large cameras and huge tape recorders. And then if they could get them to sync, they were very lucky. What year was that? Early, before 1960. So, Bob Drew saw journalism because he was in that field. He saw it as something that was stuck in word logic. And he abandoned that and wanted to find dramatic logic in which things happened. So here's how he described it. It was theater without actors, plays without playwrights, reporting without opinion. So with this pioneering camera technology, they had the ability and the mobility to sense an interesting situation, to be there when it happened. They could look in on people's lives at crucial times, find characters within it, then render it on tape or film with art and craft and intelligence and insight to make a film about what it was like to be there. This is the true meaning of cinema verite. Their debut film in 1963 was Primary, about John F. Kennedy's run for president. And that was the first film made in which the sync sound camera could move freely about and capture the events as they were happening. We're very lucky to have Robert Leacock here, son of Ricky Leacock, Robert. <laughs> Ricky had a mantra, and he had rules. No interviews, never ask anybody to do anything, to repeat a line, or to repeat an action. And the person who shot the footage should edit the footage. Maisel said that they were on fire with enthusiasm. They knew that they were a part of a revolution that was changing everything in film. Quote, we could find other people's experiences, film other people's experiences, and fulfill the dream that the Greeks had of know others and know thyself. We could do it directly, transfer one person's feelings to another, as you'll see today, and do it realistically, honestly, and with a small camera. This common shared experience was the birth of cinema verite in the documentary world of film. And it was shaped and forged by four crazy mavericks who Leacock and those mavericks were Drew, Penny Baker, Maisel, and Leacock. Leacock said, we were like jewel thieves who came together at night after a long day of shooting to show each other our gems. Today, we come to pay tribute to Albert Maisel, who for 50 long years, many of which uh, with, were with his brother David, lived by all of the above that we just spoke about. From Gimme Shelter to What's Happening to Grey Gardens, 
his artistic spirit thrived. After You See Iris, which was Maisel's last film, please treat yourself and stay for what promises to be a very special conversation with those who knew Albert, worked with Albert, and loved him. Um, I will be moderating today. Susan Lacey uh, contacted us this morning that she was ill. So our panel will include Penny Baker, and who is the last of the Cinema Verite revolutionaries. And we are lucky to have Penny with us. His filmmaking partner and wife, Chris Hedges. And finally, Susan. Hello, Susan Fromke, <laughs> Albert Maisel's longtime co-director, editor, and friend. Their full bios are in your program. So thank you. Thanks to all the Iris avatars and to all of you. <laughs> who came to share this tribute to Albert Maisel. Enjoy the film, thank you. So I can tell by the audience response that you love that film. And, uh, and we even got to see Albert in some of those scenes, which is sort of against his principle of being in the movie, but uh, instead of being there, but it was wonderful. And we have with us today three people who knew Al, loved Al, worked with Al, and I, uh, D.A. Penny Baker, Chris Hedges, and Susan Fromke. I'm gonna let them do most of the talking, but I do wanna start out with Penny because, Penny, you were one of those revolutionary mavericks who, uh, with that sync sound camera, um, yeah. started the whole revolution. And you and Al worked together. You were both, I think you were both camera people, were you not? Yeah, yeah, uh, Al was a, uh, a camera person. Al was not an editor person, as anybody who knows who worked with him. He could, wa he could shoot a, an hour of film and put it on a pair of rewinds with a viewer and run it back and forth all day long. And he'd say, why edit it? Why leave anything out? It's perfect. <laughs> and so you, you got to, to, to deal with him that way because he, uh, he was such a good shooter. Good shooter, yeah. 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 He had a great eye. He could watch something that interested him all day long. Wonderful. It, but Susan, you edited with him for a long time. You know, um, I, I came up from, I grew up in Florida. I landed at Maisel's, which was very lucky, but I actually believe in luck, as the Maisel's always believed in luck, too. And, um, you have to be lucky to be a filmmaker. You know what? You have to really depend on luck, I think, nice. when you're a verite filmmaker. And I do depend on luck, and it's never failed me, actually. Uh, but um, th they loved having me as part of the company at that time because I didn't have any film training whatsoever. They really just wanted to have people who loved people who, you know, were very interested and curious about people. And so, um, and because that was kind of what, what they were after. But in many ways, um, when you talk about those days, you have to very much also talk about David Maisel's because it was David and Albert who worked together and who really developed this philosophy or this approach, I should say, less than a philosophy, more of an approach that Penny and Leacock and Drew all kind of developed early, I guess in the late 50s and the early 60s, you know, which was really finding these stories. I mean, it was so wonderful to see this film. It's the first time I've seen it, and it, it really was fantastic, because, you know, when you've got the right subject, and you follow their lead, and uh, you don't manipulate, this is what you can come away with, these, this, these fantastic profiles, and, uh, and, and reach into the depth of, their psyche, I think, and so, um, and that was always the philosophy at Maisel's, but it's true. I mean, David Maisel's ran the company, David Maisel's worked with the editors, there were some fantastic editors in those days with Charlotte Zwerin and Ellen Hovde, who I think the back, they really were the backbone of Maisel's films, they taught a lot of us. And Albert was always in his corner of the office uh, with all the photographs of his family around him, and tinkering with that camera. It was always just tinkering with that camera, getting that camera to uh, whole focus, 
getting that Zoom lens, uh, working perfectly, calling up these engineers all around the city to help him get the right lenses made. And, and that was what he did so brilliantly in his shooting. And his real belief in this uh, approach is, uh, to me, what really his genius was. And when, you know, I was very lucky because I was able to go out into the field with the Maisels and actually work with them along with, un our a AC at the time was Bob Richmond, who also, I, I feel like the two of us, we were very lucky because we traveled so much with the Maisels. And then when David died and I got to go off with Al alone, there was this confidence in this approach that I feel that he had, um, that you really have to have in order to make these films, I think to really succeed in these films. You really, if you don't believe in it, if you don't believe in these, that, that you know, everyday life is, can be as dramatic as anything written in fiction, then, then you, it won't come back to you. And so that's what I loved going in with, into a household with Albert and shooting with him where you had to show tremendous restraint not to insert yourself, not to insert your personality, um, and, and uh, just the confidence of knowing that this was the right approach to making a film. That's, that's what I kind of always loved about working with him. Just being there. Chris, do you have something you wanna? Um, well, you know, I never worked with Al or had that privilege like many here, Robert Leacock, um, and Don Lenther, so many, you know, Don Lenther, Don. you know, so, um, you know, their perspectives are really what you should hear, but I did, you know, Al was a friend, and I saw him socially a bit, um, but I also had the kind of privilege last summer of, of spending time filming um, Al and Penny and talking about their films throughout the 1960s, and, you know, Al, almost continually um, would say things that what he believed in his films was that they brought kind of a common ground between the subject and the audience. And kind of when you saw people in their films, um, there was a type of um, union that he had hoped to create. And I don't know if he said that to you, but you know, he kept continually expressing that and, you know, and his belief that you know, why do you need a script if you have reality? And, you know, he really, you know, felt that the stories were there. Um, you know, one of the aspects of kind of going through his, his films in the 60s was getting to watch them. And, you know, he was just a consummate cinematographer and just, you know, landed with so many interesting people. I mean, from the Beatles to Brando to Orson Welles to the Stones, you know, to you know, the film on the salesman, the Bible salesman that he did. Um, just, you know, so much of life that was going on in the 60s because there weren't that many camera people and people around. Both Penny and Al were there, you know, with them. And, you know, he has just an extraordinary body of work. Tell us some stories, Penny, because you were there. You. Yeah. Tell them about going to Moscow. Yes, going uh, to Moscow, yes. Uh, well, Al had... Uh, I was. Uh, I had a friend, George Nelson, who was going to do a uh, an exposition in Moscow with uh, Charles Eames and uh, Bucky Fuller, and uh, I. He asked me if I wanted to film it, and I thought it's such a great idea. Of course, I'll be able to raise money for this. Uh, I don't even have to worry about that, and I, and I never raised a cent. But <laughs> but Al came and said, "Could he come along?" And uh, I didn't even know him then. He thinks that David sent him to me, but I didn't know David either. I, I don't know where he got that idea. But the fact is that uh, he, had, he told me he'd made this film in a, uh, a Russian uh, mental hospital. And I was really intrigued, because I was told that even ha ha showing a camera in Russia could get you sent to Siberia. So the, how he'd gotten into a hospital with a camera really intrigued me. I thought, he's a good person to have along. So I got arranged to get him a visa. And, uh, and we, the two of us spent four months in Moscow, or in Russia, all over the place, uh, just wandering around filming things that interested us. And uh, it, it was like, uh, well, it, 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 the fact is that we had only 100-foot rolls, so we couldn't uh, f film people talking to each other. 
and uh, we had handheld cameras. It was about as crude as you can imagine, and how I expect to, to make a film out of it, I still uh, have trouble understanding. But the fact is that we became not partners, we became, uh, we became sort of companions in filmmaking. And uh, uh, I got to realize that, it, 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 you know, he had the cameras that I had, I had a wind-up cine special, which is a, an old Eastman Kodak uh, handheld camera. And, uh, and we'd gotten an Araflex, a smaller handheld Araflex. And uh, we were gonna shoot all this film. We brought, oh, maybe 100, 200 rolls of, of, of Kodachrome with us. And there was no way we were gonna see it. We are gonna have to bring it back to New York to have it processed. So we were gonna be shooting blind for four months. And uh, uh, you know, none of these things worried me because I was too, uh, I was too new. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know how dumb the thing was. And uh, the idea of be being able to film in Russia, just two of us seemed to be perfectly normal. <laughs> And the Russians didn't seem to bother either because in the end, I was told, oh, you'll never get that film out. They'll take it away from you. And we went to the airport with, with 100 and some rolls in a big laundry bag, dragging it behind us. And the guys at the airport, the KGP people, whom you could tell by their shoes, all helped me get it on the plane. <laughs> so you never know. It, it was like, and everything, it was like that. Every day, Albert's fantasy, his passion, was to somehow get on a train and go to wherever that place is at the other end of Russia. So, well, it's, even, it's, it's, it's a long name, and I can't remember it. Vladivostok. That was his idea. So th we were staying at this hotel, the, uh, the Ukraine, and not too far away from us, a, 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 a music store had been converted into a, an office by eager Russian uh, politicians, and, they, and, and it actually had been put into a, it's made into a bank, sort of, and they couldn't, they hadn't gotten the piano out before they put in the, the bank front, so there was a, a, a bank where you went, went and got money, and it, behind it was a big piano sitting there <laughs> with things piled all over it, and upstairs was the guy from Vladivostok or wherever it was, who, who Al was certain could could sign the whatever it was we needed to get on the train and go. And the guy, we would go see him every week till finally he would hide from us. <laughs> and we in fact saw him at the airport when I was leaving for New York and he saw me and he ran because <laughs> he thought we were still after him to get, but, but I, I always, you know, I, I always thought the problem with that is that not only are you at some place where you have a lot of film that you can't get processed, you're a place where if something goes wrong, you can't fix it. And that train ride would be forever if you couldn't fix it. So I, I wasn't as enthusiastic about the train ride to Vladivostok as Al, but Albert never gave it up. He always was after that. And uh, at the end of, of the trip, well, at the end of the fe festival, uh, we, I came back to New York and uh, uh, he decided he was gonna to try to go somewhere to the Caspian. I don't know, he had, he had some grand idea about furthering his adventures in Russia. So I gave him all the equipment I had. It, it, and this huge lens, the lens was this big and really hard to carry. And you had a tripod to put it on, it was so big. And he loved that lens. And in the course of his, somewhere or other, on his way back to New York, circuitously, he was on a ship and he saw this periscope not too far away. So he put the big lens on the tripod and he had the camera and what he took pictures of was a Russian submarine. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't imagine, the FBI came to see us to see if they could get copies of it and we said, well, yes, we'll be happy to make you a print. It'll cost, it'll cost you something and we gave him a print. And they said, no, no, we don't want to pay for it. You should be patriotic and give it to us. And Albert said, why? <laughs> He was very upset that they went away and we never saw them again. So that was our kind of our Russian, end of our Russian adventure. He always still had that Russian adventure in mind on the train trip because in January and, you know, two weeks later he was diagnosed.
cancer, but he was like still all enthusiastic, like, Chris, let's go on the Siberia train trip. You know, right. We could do it You're right, now. he never gave up. And uh, you know, he just, it was always his dream, but also to do a train film, which he finally did do, which is now yet another latest, you know, last film of Al, which um, I have not seen yet. Mm -hmm. But um, I remember when I was filming him this summer, he did this amazing thing where he brought I was sitting in the, uh, his office with him and he kind of reached in the drawer and he brought out this tiny camera, it was about this big, and it was his very first camera. It was like a little pinhole camera um, that he had gotten as a child. And then he showed me, he said, he reached behind me, he picked up this picture and it was the first picture that he took with the camera of David sleeping. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful, it's, it's very impressionistic and you just saw it and you would know, you know, this, this guy has an eye, he's, he's yeah. gonna be a great photographer. Well, he, he kind of, he, he, and I understand this because I have the same feelings too, he, he kind of lived in, inside the camera. So he was looking out a window. He was like the, the person that they lower into the oceans to 50,000 feet who, who looks out a little window and sees fishes flying around. And that's all, they can't, they don't, they, they have no other contact with the outside world. And I feel like that when I'm filming, and I know Al did, and the thing that he always felt was that if you watch somebody, if, like when on the train ride to Vladivostok, if you watch people that you're riding with, you don't have to interview them to find out what their lives are like. You just have to watch them. And you know, I thought in this film tonight was interesting because uh, uh, Iris is never off stage. She's never not being seen by the camera, except a couple of times, when, when he's walking down the street, he sees a strange person standing by the door and he can't help but look at it, you know? You see him swinging over and watching and whoever was directing must have said, no, no, not there, here. And, uh, but in watching her, you do find out things which normally, if this was done by ABC or CBS, they would have a narrator explain to you what she was like and probably not, not be exactly accurate, but you see that she has a, a, a mind kind of categorized like Frank Lloyd Wright or somebody. In other words, she has an incredible checkoff list. She can go through and check off. And that in the end, her, her whole sort of vision of, 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 of what matters and what doesn't matter is kind of what she sees and how she chooses it. And watching her do that, I think you get, you feel almost like you know her, like she's a friend. And this is really what Al thought the camera was for. And it's, it's kind of, uh, I mean, we felt that when we, were, when we started doing this and we had to build our own cameras because there were no cameras you could carry around and, and take the sync sound and get dialogue. But that it was like a kind of new language in which you'd find people to tell you what they were up to without having to even ask them. And that was such an amazing idea at the time. Of course, nobody else was interested, but we did so many films like that. Al, uh, we did a film with, with, with a race car driver, Eddie Sachs, and we thought, you know, uh, we'd seen cars, Eddie, uh, race car films, where when the, when the the, the, the car that you're following, the race car driver you're following on, decides to pass somebody, you see a foot go on the gas, and you see a hand, you see things that are all inserted. They're shot on a nice uh, sunny day somewhere, Hell, not in the race car track. And we said, we don't want that. We don't want anything looking like that. So we have to have, uh, when he goes around the corner, we wanna see Eddie Sachs in the car driving in the race. How do we do that? Uh, you know, and Al said, maybe we could put a camera on the car. And I said, I don't think they'll let us do that. Uh, and I don't think anybody wants to do that. But what we can do is we'll build a tower down at the turn, and the tower is about 40 feet high. And you'll climb up it, Al. <laughs> he did not like heights much. But you'll climb up it, and we'll give you a camera with a wonderful uh, a gyro head that you can swing the camera very neatly and you'll get a picture of him with a long lens like you took on the Balkans, and you can get a, get a real shot of Eddie Sachs driving the car. So we did it. 
he climbed up, we helped him climb up to the top. And uh, he had this, he, the lens was this, this big. And, and he swung around, and the first two or three times, of course, he was, it, it was very hard to do. I can't, I can't imagine doing it, but he, would, he finally, he got two shots of Eddie Sachs at the wheel, driving the car, and it was such an effective, it just had, had such a feeling of reality that you thought, why would you ever do anything else? I mean, it made that kind of filming seem so worthwhile, no matter how much work it was. That's the example of being there. You know, what he said, be there. Yeah, being there. And, and capture the experience. Right. Susan, talk a little bit about <clears throat> Great Gardens editing being part of that process. Well, the um, the way um, Great Gardens came. Well, first let me just say one thing that I was going to say is the other thing that I also think. Um, well, I want to say that the day I walked into Maisel's, Albert was talking about that train trip. You know, I mean, it, it <laughs> has been big, big in his mind uh, for forty or fifty years, and I can't actually wait to see in transit the film that is going to be. I think it's at Tribeca this week. Um, uh, he finally made the train film, I'm so happy because, uh, but one of the things that Albert loved to do more than anything is talk to strangers. And, and I think, um, you know, whenever we would go, tra we travel constantly on shoots, um, you get on a plane, you get off the plane, Albert would have the person who was sitting next to him, like, would be with us for like the rest of the trip, kind of, you know, they just, or these people, we would, you know, the Maisels would go out and shoot and we'd be back at the office and people would show up with them and they would stay there for two or three months. I mean, this is, he just loved hearing people's stories, especially the stories about families and family dynamics. And, and on the, um, and I remember the first draft of this train film, it was about being on trains and, and listen, find, meeting people, talking to strangers, and going home with them, leaving, going home, and finding, uh, you know, the drama of their lives, the storylines of their lives. And that's, that's what he, he so believed in that. And um, it's just great to hear. Some of these stories I haven't heard before, so these are amazing stories that Penny's telling, too. But Grey Gardens was a fascinating, uh, obviously, one of a uh, fascinating film. Um, David Maisel's new Peter Beard, um, from the Hamptons, actually, you know. Uh, David Maisels had always rented a place in Southampton, and he knew Peter Beard socially, and one day Peter Beard came into the office, and he was at that time dating Lee Radziwill, and he said, um, Lee, and Lee wants to make a film in East Hampton about the first 10 years of her life and Jackie's life, because it was the happiest time of their lives, because their parents were not divorced, and it's, they wanted to just talk to all the people who knew the families, uh, or knew her parents. And, and so the Maisels went with Lee, but what they found is almost no one was willing to go on camera and talk about Black Jack Bouvier, their father in particular. And so um, it happened to be, coincide at the time when Gray Gardens had, according to the Beals, been raided by the Suffolk County Board of Health. And so um, she and Jackie were helping um, Big and Little B Edie Beale bring the house up to, I guess, livable conditions. And so the Maisels went along with Lee when she went to visit the Beals, and as Little Edie says, the Beals stole the Bouvier film. Um, we filmed, the footage they came back, uh, I remember that, you know, there was something always exciting about being at Maisels, always, it never ended, because it was this excitement about just going off and filming. It was, it was kind of considered a lark, and the Maisels, they, I think Al in particular would, and I think it's true what Penny said, he, he wanted to always be filming. I mean, I remember one time <laughs> um, a messenger walked into the office and just started talking to us, and the next thing I knew, the boys picked up the sound and camera, followed them for him for the next, like, two weeks. There was, I was syncing up the footage. I mean, there was, like, nothing <laughs> to make a film about. But we kept, they kept thinking there would be. They loved this man. Anyway, that was kind of the way it was in, the early 70s, certainly, when we were so bankrupt because Gimme Shelter, you know, they had, they never made a cent. Now I think they're making money from it, but, you know, somebody made a lot of money from Gimme Shelter, but it wasn't the Maisels, you know, and then we went into Grey Gardens. Well, after this film with Lee kind of um, stopped because there really wasn't a film there, the Maisels waited a year and then went back. Uh, during that year um, that we waited, uh, 
David and Al would go and visit the Beals, and the Beals thought it was very appropriate to make a portrait of themselves because they're aristocrats and they thought this would be a film portrait and they thought that was very appropriate and they invited the Maisels in. It was a real departure from the kind of approach because before that, you know, the Maisels really did not speak to the subject, so to speak, you know, but the Beals just drew them in and they became kind of what people call the triangle. Anybody who walked into Grey Gardens got pulled into a relationship between either Big and Little Evie. Um, and, and so did the Maisels. And also, um, Little Evie in particular considered the Maisels the gentleman callers that were coming to see her. And, you know, and then I'm sure you all know the film. It's, it was just a fantastic film. Albert, I think some of his shooting is just, I mean, I think he's, I mean, uh, certainly it was one of the first films I worked on at Maisels. I think the camera work is just extraordinary. The timing, uh, the intuitive, you know, very lyrical uh, way that he would shoot with his lens. I mean, the thing that was, that I think a lot of people don't realize, and, and when you see the way the cameras are changing today, uh, very few people even can still shoot with a zoom lens, th th at least my experience is, but we, you know, the Maisels would stand off in a corner and almost not move. I mean, they would be there for full days and just work off the zoom so that you do on some level, and I know no, many people don't believe this, but I believe it, you, you do disappear and people forget that you're there and people, and so you get this intimacy that you never think you can achieve. Um, really just by being very patient and spending a lot of time with your subjects, but not engaging them unless you are being pulled into. The minute you start to engage them, then you've changed the reality of what was in the room. So, I mean, there were, these kind of um, procedures that we really did follow, and um, and I think they they paid off pretty well. But that was that was I mean we all knew working on Grey Gardens that was a once in a lifetime film that you know it would be hard to ever kind of find that kind of subject again. It's so interesting the opening of that film if you know the film well is Little Edie. We used to call it the costume of the day scene where she comes out and she says, uh, "This is you know how do you you know the way she's." dress, you know, I put this, this, I put the sweater on as a skirt backwards and I safety pin it up and then I put the scarf on and the bro. And the opening of Iris is, it did, it, it just, to me, it was like deja vu all over again. It was just like, you know, we, the other thing too is little Edie um, always used to greet the Maisels at the front door and she'd say, come on in, we're not ready. And we thought, wow, that's like, that's us, you know, <laughs> we're always, we always thought that we worked with a certain amount of uncontrolled or control chaos is what we used to say, and that's what we liked. Well, when Al and I, many years later, did this film called Lolly's Kin in the Mississippi Delta, we had another great, I think, Maisel's heroine in the, in the um, character of Lolly Wallace, who was this, uh, a, you know, a, she was, um, you know, lived in one of the poorest areas of Mississippi and, um, you know, was illiterate, but she was a phenomenal storyteller just like Iris is. And, and she would open the, she, the first time we walked up to her front door, she said, come on in, I'm not ready. And it, both Al and I looked at each other and we went, oh my gosh, it's <laughs> destiny. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's, I remember that the Maisels, at the very end of Grey Gardens, if, if I'm talking to an audience that knows the film, I hope I'm not, um, for people who doesn't knows the know film. It, you, this might not be that interesting, but, at the end of Grey Gardens, where Big and Little Edie um, have an argument, a really big argument, we called it the pink room uh, scene because it's, it takes place in this beautiful room that was, you know, in this beautiful shade of um, pink that both Albert and David always loved the whole color choices of how the Beals dressed and how they, um, you know, how the, how the house had been painted at one point. Anyway, they really have this big argument and, and there was a degree of vulnerability that little Edie experienced. And then after the first stage part, one of the argument, they kind of sing together and they get reunited and then the argument blows up again. Well, both of them, they called us up at the office. We were back in New York. And they, they said, we're sending the footage in, uh, take it to do art, get it processed, sync it up, and we're gonna come in, we think we've got the end of the film. And uh, we did that, Ellen Hubdy cut it, and the, Ellen Hubdy cut it in like two or three days, that scene, and it's the exact same scene that's in the film today. And so, you know, 
the, both David and Al felt like they had the ending to the film. And, and, and they did. You know, that's the hardest thing. In those days, like with Salesman, they shot for six weeks. Greg Arden's, they saw, shot for six weeks. Um, you never know when to stop shooting. That's the hardest thing I've always very found hard. about yeah. doing verite filmmaking is when do you actually mm -hmm. start, stop shooting? When do you have a film? Yeah. And so, um, it, so the thing, so we, they basically stopped shooting after that scene and then went back about two months later and just filmed the winter, the great scene when little Edie, you know, is still yearning to leave. But the thing that's really interesting also, I think, about Grey Gardens is that, um, you know, um, I think that Albert in, uh, Albert, you know, growing up had been a full of brush salesman. I wonder if Penny had been a full of brush salesman. It seems like everybody at some point of that generation had been a door-to-door -door salesman. So he had this incredible uh, desire to film these salesmen. And I think it was David who thought of the idea of let's find valuable salesmen, but this idea of, of um, how you have to sell and how you have to approach each person uh, each door, you know, when they open up, the, the moment that you have to be able to transcend to get into the house to sell, really appealed to Albert. In Grey Gardens, you know, their father died very suddenly at 55. Both Maisels thought they were going to die at 55, and in fact, David Maisels did die at 55. But Albert actually uh, just completely, like, changed. He went for, like, 10 years where he, all he ate was salad, you know. He was not going to die of a heart attack, you know. And, um, but David, after his father had died, David had been left to home alone with his mother. And so he very much sympathized with little Edie and he always thought that little Edie's yearning to leave. He actually thought she would leave, you know. I think I was like 22 at the time. I didn't think she was gonna leave. I mean, I didn't know much about psychology, but I didn't think she was gonna leave. And neither did Ellen Hubdy or Muffy Meyer, but, um, but David did. And so, um, I don't know, it was, just, it was just such a fascinating film to work on. It, it's, it certainly sounds it. Let me, before time goes on too long, uh, is there a question that someone in the audience might have of Penny, Chris, or Susan about Al, about the films? Hard for me to see. Here's a question, yes? Just speak up and speak out, please. Well, actually, uh, I did have a question, but I was actually going to say the same thing uh, Susan just said, which is the similarity between great, the beginning of Great Gardens, where you know she's complimenting uh, David and Albert, is a similar thing here with. Uh, yeah, it just did, yeah, it did feel like David. Mm -hmm. I was just rewatching it yesterday. And, and and probably what <laughs> what he experienced when he was a door to door salesman, <laughs> you know, <laughs> may you come in, Penny. Yeah. Say anything to that? Uh, well, I know Haskell worked with him on that, uh, and uh, originally it was supposed to be a film uh, on 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 sailors, the, uh, the, the Boston Tea Party. You know, that's what they were in Boston, and uh, they couldn't find any big ships in Boston Harbor, and so it it somehow turned into door door to door salesman. But uh, uh, you know, the thing is, it's hard to remember. What, what, well, I, th I think uh, it, Capote may, I don't know, I didn't, I wasn't involved in, in that film, but Al had shot with us before. He, he did uh, uh, the Eddie Sachs, and he did Primary, of course, and then uh, we did a second Eddie Sachs, and then he shot this fantastic stuff with Castro uh, on Yankee No. So we had, we had sort of worked together, but David was always trying to get him back. He didn't like having him uh, work with us and not work with him. And David had hugely uh, ambitious plans. He wanted to do a thing with Marilyn Monroe. And he even convinced me to try to do it with my wind-up camera. <laughs> and I said, there'll, there'll be something missing from that film. <laughs> and it won't work. Well, I was going to say, David um, and Alan Bomser, they were army buddies. Alan Bomser was our longtime lawyer. <laughs> he was one of David's best friends. And he, um, his, his uncle was Milton Green. And so they That's lived right. with Marilyn yeah, in Beverly Hills. David lived with Marilyn uh, at, I mean, he didn't live with her, but they shared the same household. He and, he and um, 
Alan Baum, you know, Alan had just come out of the army and so they were living in Hollywood and David actually worked on bus stop and it was that experience of working on bus stop that made him absolutely hate traditional filmmaking. He, the yeah. idea of take one, take two, anything like that, uh, they just, it, it, I used to hear them talk about it too. And if we ever watched anybody else's films, which we almost never did unless it was like, don't look back or <laughs> one of your films, you know, as soon as the um, narrator would come on, they they both start going, "Oh no, here it comes, the voice of doom," and they <laughs> they just they just they just wanted, you know, they just hated those traditional ways, and they used to say, "Look, you know, the rules are all wrong. We're going to make our the new rules, and we're going to make these rules." And actually, we did have certain rules, you know, but um, they weren't the traditional way of making a film. Here, yes. I, I do actually. Uh, we see the finished film, um, and I'm interested in the editing process of uh, it's. It's not a diary. It's not a day by day. That you're, you're taking things that happened on day 12, maybe. And I'm, I'm interested in those decisions. Um, well, I, uh, uh, Chris and I uh, work together. You know. In, in perfect harmony, we get divorced about twice a week, <laughs> harmoniously. During but, the editing. <laughs> but, but the editing, well, I, 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 I formed a kind of concept of how it works, but you know, it's subject to, to, to anybody else's concept, which is that when you're filming, you're like uh, the old hunters of old looking for animals you know, to eat or for your dinner. And if you see one, y you get them, you shoot them, you, whatever it is. So y you shoot anything you can find. And, it, and if it applies, great. And if you can get dialogue to go with it, even better. Then you bring it all back and you, you rest up from all this. This has taken weeks and weeks to do. And, and you then sit down to make a theater out of it, which is not like the hunter. The hunter brings it back to eat it. You bring it back and want to make it something that people will pay to see. And that's theater. And th I mean, that's what the Hollywood films are, they're theater. Only these have to be different because they weren't scripted. Uh, the people in them are unknown. You've got to set them on stage in a way that makes them rememberable. I mean, it, it, it's filled with the, the certain obligations that a playwright has. Uh, that's why in the beginning, uh, you usually use a, a fairly long lens to film your, your, whoever your the heroes are going to be so that you get a good shot of them, a good picture of them that's memorable. Then later you can go to a wide angle because you're looking for the action and, and to bring it to some sort of ending. So the process is not unlike playwriting in that you're trying to make something that's of conceptual I integrity. And that's a different kind of, uh, you have to become a different kind of person, sort of. Uh, and and you, you have to figure out how to get people on stage and off stage and all these things that playwrights work out in playwright school. But you, you're doing it with people who aren't even aware that they're on stage. So you have to find a way to make everything feed to the next thing so that you have a train pulling itself along the snowy mountains. And it's kind of artful, and, and Chris is fantastic at it. And she and I have these terrible fights, and I say, you're full of shit, that doesn't mean it. And then I, the next morning I say, you know, that wasn't such a bad idea, let's look at that again. <laughs> so that, so it, 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 it's, put, it's, it's jointly done. It's not a single person's concept instantly realized. It, it's, it's kind of done the way I've been reading uh, this, this book about how the computer got developed. And, and nobody ever did anything. It was always a group of people. Even though they didn't think they, that, that it was a group, everybody contributed along the way in ways that they barely understood. And the editing is kind of like that. She didn't well, know. She didn't remember any of this. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't speak to the way that everybody worked at Maisel's, and I'd like to actually ask you some questions about that. But no, I mean, it, you know, both of them are processes of discovery. I mean, 
um, when you're making the film and you don't know what's going to happen, you know, it's, it's kind of its own detective story trying to figure out where the action's going and what your story's going to be and then you get it all back in the editing room and it's, and it's the same type of situation where you have to find the story there. You knew, you knew what happened, you only got so much of it or this or that of it. You have to, to tell it as, as truthfully and interestingly as you can and, um, and find, find the material, uh, find the story in the material. But I always wondered with, with Al, who would say things like, you know, it's not filmmaking, it's friend making that we do, oh. or, you know, sentences no. like I, that. Wait a minute, he used to say, it's serendipity happening before the camera. And we're going like, oh, no, it's not completely, we have to find the subject, we have to do this, we have to do that, you know. But I can just see him, you know, making friends along the way and right. doing it. But, some, you know, somehow, I mean, he, he is a filmmaker and he did film the, find the stories and film them, or somehow David or whatever did. But how much of the editing room process did Al? He never, never. I, it's well known. I mean, I'll never forget Drew called me up out of nowhere. I didn't know Bob Drew. I'd heard a lot about him. He said, uh, who's in the edit room these days? <laughs> you know? I said, well, for many years, you know, we had, Maisel had a very uh, long and very fruitful relationship with Charlotte Zwerin, who, who really was like the brains behind Gimme Shelter, the structure of the film within the film of Gimme Shelter. Um, she worked very closely. David Maisel's worked very, very closely in the edit room. Albert never walked in the edit room. And Drew told me this story where um, you were up at the Time Life building and, and uh, everybody was, his, it was, I said to Drew, since it was the first time I talked to him, I said, where did this whole idea of a film by come from, you know? He said, well, I had this idea that uh, we would um, all go out as a team and we'd make the film together, but then when I came back, I realized, hey, someone's making more choices than others and da 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 like this, you know? So he said, but originally the idea was that people would shoot and then they would edit their footage. That's what he, that's what he said to me. That, yeah. He said he walked into this room where Al was, and Al was fast asleep, and the, and the camera was, the, the footage was just rolling through the editing machine over and over and over again, and Al was fast asleep, and I said, that's it. Albert was interested in shooting. His love was filming, and his love was people. I mean, un, you know, and the one thing that Albert had, the one thing you need more than anything in verite filmmaking is access, and, and maintaining that access with your subject. Nowadays, because so many people are used to, you know, seeing so much on reality TV, that they think you're going to come in for one interview, you know, and they're kind of surprised when you, you know, it's, it's hard even though you've explained it that you want to follow their life. Uh, they don't, sometimes they don't get it. With Albert, because he was, there was just this incredible warmth that always emanated from him and a sparkle and this excitement for life that people liked him the second they met him, and I think that brought us in. You know, the two of us did a film for HBO on um, abortion right in the early 90s, um, when it looked like um, Roe v. Wade might be repealed, and we were filming in this women's health clinic, and only a very few people would let us film because of privacy issues. We didn't, we would just be there like on a Saturday morning, and we didn't know if we'd get anyone who would allow us to film. We, we would get one or two people who would, who would let us film them making, you know, going through the decision to have the abortion and then going in for the abortion. We had to make friends with them and, you know, make that connection instantly. And it, uh, it really does happen. And in all the cases with the people that we filmed, the women asked me and Al to come with them while they had the abortion and film them or hold their hand or just listen to them. I think so much of this is all about attention must be paid to people. You know, you're giving people a voice and that's one thing that allows you to have access, um, but you're really listening to them and you're not judging them in any way. And I think Albert in particular was fantastic in, in, in being so compassionate with the subjects that, uh, that we were able to film over lengthy periods of time with real intimacy and, and I think that makes the big difference. Yeah, I, I know when, uh, when Al and I came back from, 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 from Moscow, I'd done a film with Drew about uh, a balloon that was going up to look at Mars with the two physicists in it. And, uh, so, and that had gone on, on and on and on. And I don't think it, it, it was finished, but I don't think it's ever been released. But Drew knew me then by pretty well. So then they were starting to plan primary. And Ricky was already working with him. Uh, on, on the, and it, he had managed, Drew, by the way, 
The interesting thing about Drew, he was a fighter pilot. He shot down airplanes during the war. You know, and, and when and when when he was at Life, and and I had some contacts there, people said, "Well, you got to come up with some kind of an idea uh, if you work at Life, because you have all these famous writers and photographers, and you got to have something to to catch their fancy." And, and Drew said, "No, I don't. Just tell them I'm a fighter pilot." <laughs> and right away, he was a sort of sort of a floor hero uh, at Life, but in he had managed to coerce some money from the top of life, you know, and uh, there were two or three people that, 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 that realized that life was, in, uh, was having problems at not, not being on television, that television was going to come and give them some trouble. So the idea was how could they get into television? And Drew came up with the idea of doing uh, a series of films in which he would be sort of organized. And I don't think he had a very definite idea about it at the beginning. I think in the beginning they were sort of journalistic films, like uh, we would go up in an airplane that would do an outside loop and everybody would be weightless and you'd have a film of people floating around. And that was sort of interesting for a few minutes. And uh, that was kind of where he was at. And then in the beginning, uh, Ricky, when we did primary, he began to, and, and, and I brought Al along. And Drew said, well, why are you bringing him? We, we, we don't need, and I said, well, uh, he's a friend and, and I think he'll be helpful. And so when we got there, uh, Al had the Araflex that we'd used in Russia, with, and we had a very wide angle lens we put on it. And I said, you know, when Kennedy comes in the door, just get behind him and, and follow him. So he did. Uh, in that fantastic shot that he did. And then, then, what he did was he was behind everybody because he came in last. And Jackie is making her little shy maiden speech there. And her hands were behind her back. And her little fingers were sort of entangled in a nervous way. Al got it. He got it because that's, he looked at things. He looked and he watched and got that shot. And afterwards, Al fell in love with Al. He, could, he said, oh, but whatever we're going to do. So he came with us to Eddie Sachs. And he, he sort of, uh, from then on, uh, you know, Al was part of the show. And it, it, at, at Drew, the idea was we all were trying to figure out what to do, how to, uh, uh, we had basically, Ricky and I and, and, and Al had, had decided to go with the life operation although we were a little nervous about it, because they, they were gonna, we were going to get the money out of them to make the camera that we knew we had to make, which was a, sync ca a handheld sync camera. And, and that took us about three years to do. And we got quite a bit of money out of life, which they never, never saw leaving. They were, we put it in all sorts of ways. We tricked it up. <laughs> so they never quite knew what they were funding. But they knew it had to do with the machine shop down the street. And, uh, uh, and that was... So that we, I think for me, the first story, uh, I think the th thing that Al did on Yankee No was fantastic. And I think that they're going to run that down at the IFC, I, is it the IFC, the theater. And, and it's, it's, it's got, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a picture of the beginnings of, of Fidel's uh, Cuba, which was came out. But, but what, in it, he, spend, he spends, maybe 20 minutes in this theater and all of the people, the Fidel and the two or three people that were with him and the women that were with him, they're all on the stage. And you had such a sense of what it must have been like when, when Caesar got into Gaul. Or, uh, it had this sense of total triumph and these people are certainly bigger in life. And he got such a sense of it shooting it, that it I, I, I'll never forget it. And if, if, you, if that film comes on, you, you, you do well to see it, because it's some of Al's best stuff. Well, we have talked a long time. Yeah, we're all, are and, all and I think that you <laughs> shared some ex incredible, intimate, and wonderful stories from Penny, Chris Edgeris, and Susan Tronke. Thank you all very much. <laughs>